It works like magic. Throughout history, TLC Equation has brought to life the most extraordinary teams, leaders, and cultures the world has ever seen. Words and ideas can change the world. From Aurelius to Roosevelt, Ford to Musk, Marriott to Airbnb, Olympians, Navy SEALs, and professional athletes. Limits, like fears, are often just an illusion. TLC Equation is timeless, industry agnostic, and a proven blueprint used throughout history by ordinary people who went on to architect extraordinary visions, impacting billions of lives. That goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. I am your host, Joe Musselman. Welcome to TLC Equation, the show that explores certain universal truths behind the greatest teams, leaders, and cultures on Earth. Powered by Caspian Studios, subscribe now to TLC Equation, everywhere podcasts can be found. In this episode, we hear from Krinar Kamoni and Chad McCoy, a pair of extraordinary founders in the fight to build next generation technology that will change the world around us. Join us and welcome to TLC Equation, the after show, where we will dive deep and reflect on our time spent with Navy SEAL, Admiral William McRaven. Today, I'd like to welcome Krinar Kamoni, founder of Tive. Tive is a pioneer in the transportation and logistics industry, bringing groundbreaking solutions to global supply chain visibility through IoT sensors and a cloud-based platform. With his background in wireless electronics and data analytics, Krinar leads Tive in capturing critical real-time data on shipments worldwide driving innovation so that your high-valued goods arrive on time and in full. Today, we also welcome Chad McCoy, a former Chief Master Sergeant and Senior Enlisted Leader with the Air Force's 24th Special Tactics Squadrons. He brings his military precision to the world of the defense technology as a co-founder at Firestorm Labs. Chad utilizes his two decades of experience in defense and special operations to innovate and lead in the development of cutting-edge solutions that meet the modern challenges of warfighting and national security. Okay, so I want to take a second and explain why Krenar Komoni is on this podcast and why Chad McCoy is on this podcast about uh, leadership made simple but not easy. Uh, these are two companies that exist in my portfolio life. I've invested in both of these founders. And I want the audience to know that I put my money where my mouth is when I recognize folks that through this lens of TLC equation, teams, leadership, and culture, they're, they're unique in the way they think about all of those variables, teams, leaders, cultures. They come from unique backgrounds uh, and are humbled by the people around them. And from the moment I've met them, they've always illustrated this behavior very consistently. Uh, and so that's why these two remarkable founders are here with us today. Um, they are a few stages apart in growth. Um, Krinar and Tive uh, are early growth, and, and Chad is at the early seed uh, to a series of financing. They're in completely different sectors, but regardless, their mindset is what sets them apart and aligns them to be very near and dear to each other without ever having met. So I'm, I'm proud to have them both here and spend some time. The after show is a casual conversation around the, the moments in the main episode that spoke to people who live and breathe teams, leadership, and culture. I want to welcome Krenar and Chad to the very first inaugural after show of TLC Equation. I'm happy to have you guys here. BVVC is a dual horizon venture fund dedicated to accelerating proven national security technology while allowing first look access to special operations and the commercial sector partners that matter most. We created BV from inception to invest in mission first founders developing next generation technology companies. Our technologies have enormous commercial applications and the potential to provide US special operations with cutting edge real time prototypes to leverage for the broader defense sectors of the United States and our allies everywhere. BV targets early seed, early growth stage companies focused on the evolution from first adopters to mass market. 
In a world where innovation must collide with duty, there stand pioneer founders who envision a safe and extraordinary future for the United States and our allies. I'm Joe Musselman, founder and managing partner at BVVC. And throughout this production, I hope to share with you our mission first founders who are developing next generation tech companies with one objective to reaffirm America's position as the world's leader in computer software, hardware, and smart manufacturing technologies. To know more about our commitment to reshape tomorrow, please visit bvvc.com. Let's reimagine defense to protect our future together. Before we even get into reflecting on the podcast and the specific timestamps that we want to dig deeper into, uh, let's start with you, Chad. I mean, you come from a deep background of being surrounded by some of the most inspirational military leaders that our country's ever seen. And you've also had your share of poor leaders too, uh, amongst the same community. I always think about the special operations community. They are pro athletes, right? And even on, you know, even on pro teams, you have your good and your bad. Uh, so, so, so tell us about your leadership journey first and foremost, as being a plank owner, which for those of you listening, um, is a founder. You're a founder. You're a founder of a team. You're a founder of a squadron. You're a founder of a of something very unique inside the military. And, and Kunar, I'm starting with Chad because I think you would like to hear this too and give you a bit of background uh, as well as where Chad's coming from, from his lens and perspective. I wasn't a leader for most of my career. I was a uh, an individual operator. Um, you know, kind of the self-centered, you know, egotistical, uh, you know, everyone exists to serve me, just like everyone around me was, you know, it was kind of feed your ego and get as much as you could as far as on the operational side. And so um, leadership, uh, you know, I think everyone thinks it's intrinsic and you're like, okay, I'll lead when it's my turn, I'll lead. And what I quickly realized was leadership is really hard. Um all the, the tenets of leadership exist within every leadership book across Barnes and Nobles, right? Whether it's someone who's analyzed leaders or someone who's actually lived uh, leadership as your guest did. Um, and I probably didn't appreciate uh, leaders um, and the burden that they had and the commands mm-hmm. that I was with for a long time. And so um, when I first... I came to Joint Special Operations Command. Um, you know, the CG at the time was uh, General McChrystal. And, you know, I had no idea uh, what his legend would become, you know, after all those years of combat. I just saw him as a guy who um, lived in the jock, never slept, I never saw him eat once. Um, and then all the subsequent commanders after him had to basically live up to you know, his, his, uh, you know, mm-hmm. statement as a, a leader within JSOC and, um, Adam McRaven, you know, during his time there, um, you don't really see it until afterwards you, and you, you read the books and you realize the challenges that they had to face. Because like I said, as an individual consumer of operations, as I was, and a lot of the guys around me were, um, you just want them to stay out of the way. And mm-hmm. he was, uh, it's not somewhere you want to be as a, you know, as a mid-level leader. Leader, I'll use that term loosely. Um, but as an NCO, you want to stay a heck away from HQ. And so, but as I got more senior and and learned how to lead myself, um, you know, potentially there's a lot more empathy there uh, for the struggles of leadership. You also realize very quickly that um, a lot of the leadership uh, skills are not innate; they're developed, they're grown. Um, and they come at a, a very uh, premium uh, cost. I, I, I want to interrupt you. Are you of the school that leaders are made and not born? I think people have um, attributes that will make them a successful leader, or whether they're charismatic, whether they are really organized, have an excellent memory, you know, idi- some idiot savant. Um, but I think the, the fundamental aspects of leadership can be learned. But they have mm-hmm. to be learned through reps and experience. Um, but having a body of experience to come into a room and have credibility, which Adam Warren Craven talked about in your guys' podcast, um, mm-hmm. is a differentiator. And so 
and, and that exists within industry and the military alike. And so there's really not a whole lot of difference between the two. So McChrystal walks in and he does walk in rooms and there's just this energy to him. Like it's, I, I can't explain it. It's like the X factor, right? It's there's certain founders, certain founders have it, you know, certain public servants have it uh, more than others, but there is an energy to McChrystal that's a little different. Um, where if, even if you didn't know he was someone, you would feel as if he was someone. And, and that is, and, you know, kind of an X factor in, in, in that man's energy. Um, Krenar, same question to you, you know, walk us through your leadership journey summary. And, um, I, I think you both have so much to learn from each other and I have a ton to always learn from you. And, and so give us an example of yeah. your leadership journey to date. I mean, it's a, it's a long journey, but I would say maybe just a snippet of memories. That way we can solidify it and make it more concise for this. I yeah, grew sure. up, as you, as you know, I grew up in Kosovo um, and this uh, country that went through war. But I came to U.S. in 2001 when I was 17. Um, luckily, I went to Northfield High School in Vermont, and I got accepted to a university there called Norwich University, which is private. It's just a private military college. And back home, I constantly hung out with various entrepreneurs at companies. So entrepreneurship and leadership sometimes are not the same thing. <laughs> I learned a lot about sure. leadership at Norwich. I would say being surrounded by the military environment, seeing professors dressed up in uniform, seeing ROTC kids, seeing just cadets wake up every single morning, do the routine that they had to do, going to classes with them, uh, it, it just learned a lot. But one thing I realized in leadership is because the four years that I was there, every year you had a new cadet colonel, which is the student who leads the troops and leads mm -hmm. the university. He's the leader. And what I saw in four cadet colonels since I was a freshman, these were not people with big egos. Mm -hmm. These were just true students like me. When I became a senior, I knew, well, like obviously knew the cadet colonel, but even juniors, freshman, sophomore year, they were kids like me, I would say, yeah. who cared. They truly yeah. cared about others and cared about other students and cared about other teammates and colleagues and friends, essentially, in that school. And that's what I realized. Leadership is really about caring and caring about the people instead of just an ego and a position. And... Um, how they chose the cadet colonel is just quite unique at Norwich, but that's uh, just seeing that with my own eyes, I think it was something mm. I learned a lot. Chad, there's a few instances in your community where that's the case. I mean, not always, and for most leadership positions, no. But what are some examples uh, that you can draw a comparison to where leaders are chosen? Leadership in the military can be a revolving door, you know? Um, and, you know, I, I think I was using a little bit of hyperbole when I said that everyone's an egomaniac or, you know, I think what I'm trying to illustrate is that, um, you know, there's leadership and then there's kind of the doers and the action guys that go get the job done. And there's a badge of honor to be the guy who's doing right. Um, now, when you peel the onion back a layer within, within that dynamic, there's leaders, there's leaders that lead you know, outside of garrison, lead them in combat. And to me, those are the most prolific leaders, right? But they don't fit into the category that maybe we're describing right now. We're not talking about, you know, someone making really dynamic life and death decisions as a leader. I put that in a very, almost like a sacred category, okay? I think what we're defining is the parallel between, you know, the management leadership style of bureaucratic process in the military and then leadership of a company which is managerial at times, right? And so, you know, getting a, a, a team of people to follow you, which is what you do in a startup, right? So we have an idea, come join me. So do you have to be charismatic to accomplish that? Potentially you do, or potentially you have to have the, the you know, uh, the technical background for people to say, that's where I'm going to go because I believe in that. And so there are parallels in all of it, but none of it is the same. And so in the beginning, I said that, you know, leadership is kind of one size fits all. Uh, the caveat is, is that no kidding, combat leadership in life, life and death situations um, is very different um, because you can't approach people the same way um, because leadership is, uh, it's based on circumstance. It's based on the environment. 
it's situational. And so um, when I have to get something done, we're talking about our kids and I, I demand something that's done for their safety is very different than me sitting down and explaining to them the why and then getting them to do what I want. And so, um, but like I said, can it be developed, you know, or is it innate? I think those are developed qualities, you know, those are developed over, you know, people's failures. Sure. There's, an, there's another part of the question too, that I draw parallels often between startups and military, but one in one parallel in particular is always, it always gets the eyes of both attention. So founders listen up to this comment. Um, in the military, specifically in special operations, um, whether you're a PJ, whether you're a SEAL, whether you're a JTAC, whether you're at MARSOC, whatever, sometimes leaders, most, most times, leadership does not mean rank whatsoever. And the leader at, in most circumstances uh, is not the person with the highest rank, but with the most respect. So there's something that I think is interesting that I've taken away, even in venture, that there's a tremendous amount of respect paid to folks based on AUM, right? Assets under management, right? When really, what does that mean in regards to respect? Like, I, I truly, I don't know what that means. They have a network. Uh, that's what that means. Or they're able to uh, obviously pull together a, a, a wonderful fundraising strategy. Um, but this is why I think being a VC in the defense space where AUM matters not, but respect does and trust currency matters and all of these things. It's a total gut check for me in the sector because uh, you have to remain true to that, to the community you mean to serve. It's like the number one rule in design thinking. You have to emulate the community you mean to serve, right? So if I'm serving a defense-oriented community as a VC, well, then I don't care about AUM. I care about trust currency. I need to have AUM in that direction. Um, and so, Kanar, we've talked about this with your whole leadership team. Um, in Boston around that table that, you know, who are the leaders here, the folks that aren't at this table, but are out there in the company, not, they're not recognized by rank, but they're recognized, meaning people in the organization flock to them when they have certain issues to be answered, even though they don't wear the, the captain's, you know, Jersey, or they don't have the, the title. It doesn't matter that even senior leaders flock to this person to get answers. And, and so I'd ask the same question to you about, you know, the difference between leadership title. And you're one of the most humble founders that I've ever met, Grenar. Um, I don't mean to embarrass you, but it's just the damn truth. And your humility score, I remember thinking about it, uh, or it's a humility score I do with founders, and it's also called followership. You have tremendous followership, right? And, and so talk about that, how you, I mean, one of the values at your organization, um, not only just keep it simple, but always learning it's grounded in humility so talk to us about how you think about respect earned respect rank and respect i think it ties to the norwich observation that i had there with cadet colonels that mm. people really respect others who care about them and respect comes from that from that genuine authentic care mm -hmm. and if you show other humans that you genuinely love people that you genuinely mm -hmm. care about them i think that's where respect comes into play i think that's a that's something that i've always tried to be and try to become um one of the things you mentioned there rank usually the people inside the company that are the true culture warriors that are keeping the mm -hmm. culture alive are sometimes yes. not even the position on the executive level are working at various positions inside the company and they're really making sure that this culture stays alive and whether it's with fun events whether it's jokes whether it's a lot of different things that they really yeah. care about inside the company to keep it alive and they set an example for everybody even myself to continue to really believe in what the culture that we built um yeah that's i would say one thing and our first value in the company is transparency no matter what, transparency is first, everything is second. And the reason why I've picked that is because it ties a little bit to authenticity. And yeah. one thing that I really value inside of our company is to always be authentic. And because I believe I'm quite authentic <laughs> with people and myself yeah. and the rest, and that authenticity, even though it comes off as humble and maybe humility, because that's who I really am, that's maybe why I have... Um, 
I would say, decent followership. And it, when when leaders start to deviate from authenticity because they believe they have to look like something or be like someone or act like yes. something that they've seen in a movie or a documentary or a TV, yes. then I think that's where it really decouples. Uh, and when that decouples, people clearly see that. And when people clearly see that, obviously, you don't want to follow a leader like that because that's driven that's by right. just surface. Yeah, so this is a great segue into another part of this conversation, which is about alignment, absolute alignment. And we talk about this often. My biggest fear when I invest in any company is how are these founders going to scale their vision, mission, and value set throughout the entire organization and sustain it forever, right? Like people forget that and no matter what business you're thinking of, whether it's in the Fortune 100, 1,000, 5,000, what doesn't matter, at some point, all those companies were startups. At one point, they were all very small businesses and they grew big as a result of alignment, absolute alignment from the top to bottom, what I call up, down, and all around. And you both are in charge of that. You're stewards of this. And the beginning stages, um, it's the chiefs. And you both have been chiefs. Um, so what I mean by that, Krinar, you are the chief executive officer of an organization called Tive. And Chad, uh, at one point in your career, you were called the chief master sergeant. Um, and not only that, but you were called the senior enlisted leader. Leader was in your title. Um, special tactics squadron special was in your title. Chief was in your title. Krenar chief was in your title. This is a good segue directly into why is it so lonely in your role and position? And that was one of the first conversations, part of the conversation that we had with McRaven, that not only are you trying to build this absolute alignment up, down, and all around your institution, and now, Chad, obviously, you're, uh, you're a co-founder of the company and clearly a leader at the organization. So we have two founders on the call who are at the very top of the institution. They're charged with absolute alignment of the company's vision, mission, values all the time. And it can get lonely. And so one thing we talked about, and we'll, we'll jump to the, to the clip uh, of battling loneliness in command. Uh, and the second thing is, why is it lonely in command, and how do you get used to it? You, you get used to it by making sure, as you well know, Joe, that you have to have a swim buddy. You have to have somebody that you trust implicitly uh, that when those days are lonely. And it's lonely in command because at the end of the day, you are ultimately responsible for the decisions that are made about your organization. And Krenar, we've spoken about this offline. Um, Chad, you've lived this throughout your life in many different ways. How do you two think about it's lonely in command? I, I'm just going to follow up maybe with Admiral McRaven's, what he said, it's lonely, but you're not alone. I think he said that on the interview. He and and he, yeah. he was, he's, he's right there. It, it's decisions you got to make. It has to be your, at the end, the decision that you choose as a chief executive. That's why you have mm -hmm. that title and that's why you're in the command of a particular company or troops or uh, mm -hmm. whatever you're leading. However, you're not alone. You get to speak with your peers, you get to speak with your board members, you get to run ideas by them, you get to speak to your advisors. Mm -hmm. If you're completely alone, and or like Admiral said, if everybody's telling you, oh, you're the best, everything, all your ideas are the best, obviously you're going the wrong direction. Yeah. And, um, I think having those trusted advisors around you, I mean, you, Joe, have been a trusted advisor for me. Sometimes I call you when I'm going through some things and I need to make a decision. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you don't have the answer, but just running things by you on a trusted way, I think it's helpful quite a bit. So you're not, you, you might be lonely, but you're not alone. Yeah, I, I don't think the job of a VC at all is to ever have the answer, truly. Like the founder has the answer within themselves. It's our job to nudge them and encourage them to help them realize they have the answers and they have the capacity to make the right decision. That's the way that I think about it in that particular case. Yeah. And okay. Chad, how about you? Yeah, I think that's the mo most important aspect is surround yourself with people you can trust. Um, my last role, you know, as, as the chief of a unit, um, I had actually cut my teeth as a leader below that 
running a smaller organization. And I, you know, to Cronard's point about authentic leadership, I tried to emulate the guy before me as it was a, uh, it was oil and water. And so I realized that I'm, I can be empathetic. Um, I can be emotional. And so those, those are qualities that make me me. And so I need to embrace those. I need to just care deeply like you were describing. And then when I went to the next level of leadership, um, I had guys that were, had tremendous operational experience, um, and I needed them to buy in, but I also needed them just as much as they needed me. And so our battle rhythm event was to sit down together, to go over every decision together, you know, within reason. Um, obviously, I have decisions that I make, but um, once we all had it on the table and we, you know, kind of discussed an issue to, you know, to where we feel like it's okay, then I take that information and I make a decision. And that that applies to, you know, a CEO uh, that applies to anyone within, you know, a C-suite who has maybe executives that maybe they don't see eye to eye with. Um, you need those trusted resources. Um, and I think family um, can fill in the gaps with that as well, right? So sometimes it's cathartic to, uh, you know, to decompress with your wife and tell her exactly what's going on um, and get a, a calm, you know, uh, objective view at something. Um, and then, you know, the other one is is letting time and space between decisions um, allows that, um, you know, that's that, that time you need to, to really make, make good decisions in, um, in isolation. And so, um, but yeah, I, I agree with everything you guys said. I think it's spot on. Again, I think leadership is kind of cyclic and it, uh, you know, we're not really learning new lessons. We're, we're relearning old lessons. Mm. Yeah. I don't think, there's enough conversation that takes place for the founders that are married on the importance of their greatest partner in everything and work in life. I don't hear enough founders talking about that. Uh, they talk about it almost like it's completely and entirely separate. So I'm glad Chad, you brought that up. It's something I think about all the time. I just had this conversation with a founder two days ago and asked you know him how often he spends time kind of consulting with his wife on these issues because no one in the world knows you better than you, than your wife. Um, and so, you know, leaning, uh, Kunar, I remember the very first call that we had with each other uh, was right at the onset of COVID. And I could see your wife kind of corralling the children in the background and you were just, you could tell you were so nervous because this is a totally new thing for everybody, right? Um and I, I saw her just being a great partner and trying to keep everything together for you on this call. And, you know, when you're watching founders and you kept like looking up to the right <laughs> as, you're, as you're watching, you know, go, it's things go on in the background. Um, but maybe talk a little bit about this, because I think this goes, um, you know, hand in hand with absolute alignment that if you're going to be your authentic self, why would you not want to lean on folks that are closest to you? I don't hear enough VCs or founders ever talk about the importance of leaning on a significant other uh, to help you make tough decisions. Yeah, I think even Admiral McRaven mentioned, right? He said, I'm a man of faith. I'm a man of faith too. And and whether it's God and then your spouse, those are the closest things sometimes you have. If you, if, But again, even that's why it's not that lonely <laughs> at the top. Right. Because <laughs> you have people like your wife there and she knows for me what I'm going through every single day, every single week. She can see it in my eyes. She can see it in my smile. She can see it not in my smile. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sometimes. And um, the reason why I started the company is because of her, because of her dad. I mean, we track shipments all over the world and her dad had a trucking company back in Worcester, Massachusetts and started. There must be a better way. <laughs> so she knows this business intimately really well. Um, and she's been, I would say, I don't know. I don't think I would be able to do what I'm doing without her. Uh, the amount of support and mm. love and care and everything she does for our family at home and myself. I mean, it's just, uh, there's no way. Without a supporting partner like that, founders, I don't think, can build businesses. And I don't think I would have been able to get tied to this place. Yes. I would crumble if that part of my life was in disarray. Um, Chad, how many deployments has your spouse been through? Uh, almost all of them. So she's a 14 or 15, uh, cause I only did a few before I met her. Um, wow. 
you know, uh, somebody, people always look to caveat their short ones, you know, within soft, you know, four month yeah. deployments, but, um, but still, <laughs> if you're not deployed, you're training. And so for me, you know, I, I will tell you what I don't, sometimes I'll talk about what's going on, but it's really hard to explain. It's just like in the military, explain the acronyms or uh, a different market or, you know, relationships. It's just convoluted. So I can leave that out. But I think what um, spouses are also very good at is recognizing stress. Um, I am my own worst enemy. Is I'll drive very, very fast. And sometimes I'll drive the car off a cliff. And um, yeah, what she's good at is saying, hey, Chad, you're stressed. And I'm like, no, I'm not stressed. And she's like, I see your stress. And, you know, for us, and when you're, especially when you're working from home and you're working, you know, nonstop and just never stops, if you don't have an office to clock in and clock out of, um, she's a good, uh, you know, barometer check for me that um, I probably need to take a break. I need to go play with the kids, Um, you know, take a knee and, and, and drink some water. Some paths are forged through relentless grit, unwavering dedication, and a touch of destiny. Meet Rebecca Rouse and Joel Del Rosario, two souls whose journeys epitomize these virtues. Rebecca, a force in the weightlifting arena, stands out resolutely among the nation's finest. And then there's Joel, a Marine Corps warrior with nearly two decades of service, marked by multiple combat deployments and a Purple Heart, awarded for the sacrifices made in the line of duty. Together, their shared spirit of tenacity, honor, and resilience culminated in a vision, Semper Stronger. This isn't just a fitness initiative, it's an institution forged from valor and ambition. It beckons those with the heart of a champion, offering not just routines, but transformational journeys. Their workouts, whether centered around the finesse of a kettlebell or the might of a barbell, are designed for the dedicated, those who pursue mastery with every heartbeat. And a special shout out to our brave first responders and military personnel. Semper Stronger reveres your dedication, crafting a regimen that's every bit as resilient as you are. For those with an insatiable thirst for excellence, where challenges are but milestones on the road to greatness, Semper Stronger is your anthem. Join their legacy. Immerse yourself in excellence at SemperStronger.com and connect with them on social media at Semper Stronger. You know, this this conversation also represents an analogy in real time of what I've been saying for a very long time. And the reason why I went from working with the special operations community uh, and wanting to support founders, I don't think a lot of people in career transitions think about the customer uh, in their choice, meaning, okay, I wanna go work for these companies But they don't think one often, they don't think often about one layer deeper of who are the customers this company is serving. And in my transition, I was thinking about, I have been serving members of the special operations community for years. How am I ever going to find another community that thinks, acts, feels, and communicates with such urgency, right, than the special operations community? And then I started to really dig deep into that. And I broke it down into attributes and traits and principles and beliefs Um, and it turns out through this kind of equation, like who has a similar vision, mission, value set in the world, who has similar principles, who has similar character or ethos, you know, who, who comes from a certain type of team and who's a leader and what type of culture do they follow? I arrived at founders. And if you really think about it, I'm not making a direct comparison here. Like Chad signed on a dotted line to serve this country. So out the gates, he was willing to give his life for something greater and bigger than him. And he signed on a dotted line to formalize that, right? So there's a service or there's a a spirit of service to Chad out the gates in his professional life, whether he calls it that or realizes that or not, it's there. When I look at founders like Krenar, and I don't need anybody to get up in arms over this. I don't think Krenar would compare his, his service to Chad's service or anybody else, but the the point that I'm trying to make is that there's a philosoph- there's philosophical alignment that at some point, Krenar signed on a metaphorical dotted line to give his life up to something bigger than himself, to achieve something bigger than, than just Krenar. 
And that's the alignment that I see consistently with the best founders. Not all founders think this way, and it's a big part of my decision process. But the founders who do think this way, that did sign on a metaphorical dotted line, where they are obsessed. Kanar, I joke often for you that, you know, I don't know anyone in my life that is jazzed about trackers than Kanar. He is so excited. To I talk don't either. About, oh, right. Exactly. <laughs> There's something unique about that, which is attributable to you as a person, a technologist, an engineer. And it's the same way with Chad, who gets so excited to walk people through his product and what it can accomplish. Um, I'd like to talk about your, the way you think about your service, both as a founder, both founders and one inside of, uh, you know, one coming from a service oriented, uh, background, and then you have creating a service oriented, uh, looking forward. So I'd love to hear more about your idea of service and maybe just tie it a little bit on the metaphorical dotted line and where that is resonates true to me. And I would 100% agree with you, Joe, I would never ever compare with anybody serving in the uh, in service in military and thank totally. you for your, for your service, Chad, thanks to everybody. Um, that's a that's a that's a different line. Um, but on on the type side, in 2019, we almost failed as a business. And we had $20,000 in the bank, and I barely got the company to survive again after talking to 100 plus angel investors and VCs after spending $5 million, we almost ran out. But one thing that was on my mind that is true today, and it's always going to be true is, I said, if this company fails, and it goes bankrupt, I'm going to figure out again to start it from scratch and start Tive again, and build this company from nothing again, because that's how much I believed in it. And that maybe ties into that metaphorical line that you got to have as a founder, you got to have that type of a belief, which I do in the business um, and in the industry. Otherwise, it's not worth it. I remember the question I asked you. And one of the questions <laughs> I asked you in our very first call was, what would you be doing if you weren't doing Tive? And your response was doing it again. <laughs> exactly. Like you would just do it again. Like I, and so right there, you, you think it's a BS answer. It's not. But when you're talking to someone who doesn't believe it's a BS answer, you can feel whether it's truth or bullshit. I would do it again. <laughs> That's really cool. You know, I've, I've made the, um, the correlation before with other folks that um, the, the startup world, entrepreneurship, uh, founding teams, are the closest thing you can get to the dynamic of being on a soft, soft units, special team. Um, I wouldn't say military at large, but I would definitely say the identity mm. and purpose of a, a you know, a, a special operations team. And I don't mean that I, well, the humor is sometimes similar. Um, and Joe, you know who I'm talking about, you know, th we have a good, a good crew of guys, but, um, yes. the humor is there, but, the purpose and rallying around an idea in the early stages where everyone's just doing whatever they can to get there um, uh -huh. is what I'm used to. That's the environment that I'm used to. My first job in the military, you know, was certainly not that. It was people, they were satisfied to get a paycheck and kind of do their job and go home. And this is a different experience. This is, listen, I know where I'm going to go and I don't need anyone to tell me what to do. I'm going to do it. I need help, certainly. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to motivate me. And so, um, and then the other piece is layering on um, the right people, you know. And, um, you know, my first hire was a former teammate of mine who I trust implicitly. And, and you know, Brett Barbie, uh, better, better operator than me, better leader than me. And you surround yep. yourself by people that are better than you. And, um, you know, it's proved to, to be a, a good model and we'll continue to do that. But, but yeah, that's, that, those are my thoughts. One thing that, you know, I think about often is there's a, there's a word that I learned in serving the community for many years, and that's relevancy. Folks that are in transition from the special operations community into their next great adventure in life, it boils down to wherever they go next, will I be relevant? Will I feel relevant? And there's no other, there's no better place to feel relevant than kind of parachuting metaphorically into a startup where things barely work. There's less than five people and there's nothing but a big idea that may or may not change the world. 
right? It's that classic Ernest Shackleton job description that we've all seen, like little pay, little recognition, uh, almost certain death, like jobs, job posted here, like come join us, right? Like that's the true nature of a special operator. And and one thing that comes out of relevancy uh, is that in the special operations community, the bottom line that you're dealing with is loss of life. And in the startup community, the bottom line is loss of dollars. It's not exactly the same thing, but it does, but both do bring a certain sense of urgency of success and failure to any given situation. Um, and, and for me, you know, working with both of you, you've both illustrated a uh, high sense of relevancy and urgency around what you are building. Um, and now talking a bit about bad actors, you brought up, uh, you know, the, the teammate you brought from the special operations community. And I'd like you to start with that as we talk about spotting bad actors in a work in work and life and how you two have built certain filters to spot bad actors and versus good actors and, and, and how you allow people to kind of reveal themselves to you over time. So how do you filter out bad actors versus the good actors that you just described in both work and life? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a function of experience. Um, yeah. You know, some people have an intuitive sense of, uh, you know, the, I guess the term nowadays is a little bit of an emotional quotient, but I would offer sure. it, it's an emotional quotient in the sense that you can read the room, you can read people. Some people are just very good at it and some people are terrible at it. Yeah. But the one thing that you, you learn very quickly as you go through life is, you know, you, you find these people that seem to be nice on, on the outside and then you find out they're not good human beings on the inside and you can begin to recognize them over time. Um, but, you know, but everybody in an organization uh, that is kind of at the senior level should bring some value to the organization. Uh, you know, you don't, you want a diverse organization. You want an organization of people that are prepared to, uh, again, talk to you and not be afraid to tell you when you're walking into a minefield. Uh, those are the people that you want to gravitate towards you. But Krenar, first, maybe start with a good actor. In, in, yes, in I was going to say, that's a, a very good actor. <laughs> a very good um, actor. Yeah, very good actor. Um, and it just the story with when we were struggling back in 2019 and it was just a few of us i think it was like six people in the company and lennon who was our vp of software every day maybe every second day every third day but every time i would walk in i would sometimes see in watering the plants in the office i'm like this guy really cares like truly cares about the business. And you can see that from the actions he's taking because he's creating an environment where all of us want to be happy and want to see something grow, which is the most basic thing, which is plans. But him, I see in him there with devotion and care, water those plans. And I know with that kind of devotion and care, he builds our software. <laughs> There is nothing that can replace that kind of a, uh, an amazing actor. And he's the gold so. standard, right? So how did that gold standard help you early measure up against bad actors? Like that's not someone that's going to water the flowers. That's not someone that's going to sweep the floors. Yeah, I think that's a, for me, a tough one to answer, I would say. I mean, you always say, oh, we're, we can hunch. We have the gut feeling. It's the beginning. You're always right. But sometimes you're not. I th the, And mm -hmm. the way I approach things, it could be to fault sometimes, but I start with 100% trust. I don't start with 0% trust and then fill up the bucket because I think it's impossible to fill up that bucket if you We're start at zero. Yes. So I yep. start with every human being, every executive, every person, every employee, every advisor, every investor with 100% trust. And then the goal is to keep maintaining that. Sometimes there's a dip, but it goes up again <laughs> and you continue to maintain it. I think similar to Admiral McRaven, he said, sometimes the troops maybe lose, not trust, but um, belief on the direction or something that's mm -hmm. happening, but you lose the locker room, right? Like he said, but you get to, you get the opportunity to build it back up again. Mm -hmm. And when you're at hundred, if you go to 95, you have an opportunity to go back to hundred, but if you're at zero and you start like that, I don't think it's a, uh, it's, it's impossible, but sometimes bad actors, uh, when you start at hundred, I think you come to see them quicker because you have everybody at that high level and the bad actors filter themselves pretty quickly. 
Mm. I don't have any specific examples, I would say, but that's how I look at it in high level. Chad, how about you? So I'm going to answer your question the way I usually answer things, kind of my, in my own way. Um, I, I associate it to culture. And uh, in the military of the past you know, decade or so, they tried to bring in a lot of business you know, vernacular into the military. And it was super annoying to all of us. You know, what's the ROI on this? What's the value prop? All this other stuff that didn't, it was misaligned. But they would start yep. talking about culture and forcing culture down people's throats. Say, we want a positive culture. Well, you don't build positive culture by telling someone to create it. And positive culture is built, to, in my opinion, in my, my professional opinion, is built by the right people hiring, hiring the right people on and then empowering those people at the lower levels. It doesn't come from, like, you and I can break culture, right? We can destroy culture. Mm -hmm. We can behave poorly and, and get it off the rails. But really, the strong cultivation of culture comes from the lower levels. And it's the guys like you're talking about, Krenar, the guys that are willing to do the small things, that are, are good followers, right? Because we were talking about leadership in the beginning, but leadership and followership, it's like a dance, right? You got to come in and out of those mm -hmm. roles. And... Um, and I see, you know, culture is the lifeblood of an organization. You can determine it through who you hire and who you don't hire. And so the reason I bring up culture into this, this question is because you have to be really good at spotting this because bringing the wrong person into organization, that cancer that it creates will destroy a culture, will destroy an organization very quickly. Um, and it takes a long time to rebuild it. And especially as you grow, we're so small right now that every hire is, you know, it's really important and you can't really hide. As, you, as an organization right. grows, you can hide. And then those little cancer cells will affect things that you don't see. When you're, you know, 20 people big, um, you're going to see it very clearly. And so um, these are really important aspects for leaders. Um, and I would consider HR in the leadership, you know, kind of circle as well, because you know, as they bring on these folks, how are you sussing out? What are the attributes you're looking for? Bernard, it seems like you have a very good, you're very calibrated to what you want. Um, not everyone has that calibration through experience, right? And so, um, but I, I always have to measure my opinions, uh, my instant, my gut feelings based on a military world that's very different than where I'm in now. And I think sometimes mm -hmm. it makes me a little bit, uh, maybe overly sensitive, right? So I'm trying to maybe placate to kind of the organization I think I'm in. And then I get reminded very quickly that some of these are universal truths. And so, um, you know, for me, I'm, I'm growing, I'm in my forties and I'm growing in my second life. And, and so I'm learning or reinforcing things or removing things. But Krenar, it sounds like you have a, an excellent outlook on this and you're obviously running an organization in a, in an, uh, in an awesome fashion. I'd, I'd love to work for you, man. One day if I ever make it, <laughs> maybe you'll have me. <laughs> I wish it was excellent. I like Admiral said, we're not perfect, and I, I like his ending. I don't. I know we're not want to end this conversation here, but just want to be good. At the right. end, I, I don't think we're gonna achieve like achieving greatness. We're gonna strive for it, but at the end, if people say did good, um, you know, hum, human aspect of things, I think uh, we've achieved a lot. Yeah, that was a powerful statement. But he said, I don't, I don't need to be great, but I would like people to look back and say he was good, right? He was a good man. He was a good leader and I can live with good. Yeah. I just hope you know, from a military standpoint, I hope people say, you know, McRaven was a good officer. That's, that's all I'm looking for. If, if the people that worked for me thought I was a good officer and by that said, you know, he was a person of integrity. He cared about the troops. Uh, you know, he did the missions the best he could, man, I would be, happy with that legacy mm -hmm. you know as a person i think it's the same thing i hope people who know me would say hey bill mcraven's a good person yeah. um you know i don't have to be a great person i don't have to be a great officer right. uh, i'm okay with good <laughs> uh, because life is challenging enough that it's it's hard to be great um I'd like to be great, but I'll settle for good. Right. <laughs> right. That yeah, was, very of course, it, of course, that's incredibly, you know, humbling. I, there's a quote that I sent, even a, uh, a reminder that came up in a conversation I was having with a, my, one of the, uh, my fund vice chairman, who's very near and dear to my heart. He's my greatest sounding board. Uh, we have aggressive conversations about, 
uh, all sorts of topics all the time. Um, and, and you know, where he's sharpening me, I consider these conversations to be whetstones, uh, for me. Uh, and you know, whetstone conversations, meaning I feel like I'm getting sharper every time I have them. I think we all need to have these people in our lives, but you know, Krenar, one thing, you know, not to pile on some compliments to you. I, I don't want to invest in people that I wouldn't work for. Like to me, that's a pretty simple bar, right? Would I quit my job? And of course, to all my LPs, I'm not quitting my job. I love my job. I'm, I would never quit, but the bar that I have, uh, to follow is very high and both the people on this call i would quit my job and i would work for so for me that's a big part of my investment process and strategies i i have to think to myself would i go and give up my life that i have currently to go work for these two people and i i absolutely would for both of you and chad one thing i have to admit uh and kind of reveal about granada i mean I always say that folks that pay attention to, you know, vision, mission, values, team, leadership, culture, in the earliest stages of the business are going to win because it means they're establishing a certain expectation for all hires that come in after them that we care about this stuff here. Why? Because it's been, it's already done. And I just got here and I'm headcount 18 or I'm employee number 25 and they have a whole company constitution. The brand is set, it's aligned and we're activating on what we believe that was one of the first exercises that I flew to Boston to do yep. with the Tive team. Was we, we have to think about how do we align our objectives and key results to our vision, mission, values of this firm. And that's a challenge, right? That's a challenge in military leadership. You know, we say externally that we believe in these things, but then at the operating level, Chad, to your point that culture is developed kind of from the ground up, it's developed from the ground up, not necessarily the top down. Um, too many startups lose sight of that, that if it's a top down pushed opinion and it's not bought in from the ground up, you'll never meet in the middle as an organization. And I think that's really important for you. I would say you did an excellent job. I think I've ever seen somebody do a job like this and talking about with Chad's comments around bottom up, you went and listened to not just leaders, but a lot of other people in the company. I and did. listen to what words they were using about our company, what values you th they thought that the company brings, what the mission, what the vision they believed in the company is. And then what you did is just this plethora of words and figured out the frequency of those words. It was just amazing to then realize that, wow, all the things like transparency to be the number one word that comes up and for me to innately believe in it and also that's right live by it anyway and seeing it throughout permutating and throughout the company as a word that was most frequently repeated it was just so eye-opening and i felt number one really good about <laughs> leading the company <clears throat> but also that uh, it's it's we're we're aligned on that and yeah thank you for doing that so, i mean oh yeah, of course you're welcome everyone in my uh, portfolio has access to that just they just have to let me know they want it. And this is not this is something I learned from um, basically uh, Yoda of Silicon Valley. Uh, if I said his name, most of you might not even rec recognize him. Um, uh, he's a very private person, so I won't bring up his name. But we're talking first check into Google, you know, Sun Microsystems, Verifone. Like, uh, he's, a, you know, he's, a, he's a true legend. But he said one thing that I know for certain um, is that only until you say something, until you are tired of saying it, is it just sinking into everyone else? And so founders may think that preaching over and over and over again about this, that, or the other, about transparency or about authenticity or about leadership, that you might just be saying it ad nauseum and no one's paying attention. No, it just takes a while for the the speed and pace and urgency of a startup to to actually hear. Is he talk? What's he? Oh yeah, he's talking about that again. And when I interviewed members of your institution, up, down, and all around, they were aligned. And that's a that's only a post in, that's a post investment of 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 time that you don't have time to do that type of investment uh, in the you know initial when you're about to write a check for a company. They're not in their right mind. They wouldn't. They shouldn't give investors access to that type of personal uh, connectivity to their institution until skin is in the game. But man, I was, it's also a relief for me when I talk to an institution, like, wow, they are so aligned. They get each other. They're listening to each other. Everything Krenar said, they said. Um, 
and so I'd love to do this at Firestorm eventually, Chad. It's uh, it's a remarkable exercise, and it brings everyone closer together. And would you would you say, Joe, and maybe Chad for you too, and alignment on values and culture? Do you think that's more important than aligning on objectives and goals that you got? Because those can change, and I, I I feel like values and culture probably are more important. Can we not have our cake and eat it too, or? You know, I, I, cause I, I agree with what you're saying. Um, but I think we should do both. I agree, but if yeah, you have to pick yeah. one or the other. Man, that's tough. I, I don't know if you can have one without the other personally. I, I don't know. That's a good question. That is a good question. They are intrinsically linked to some degree. If you put the way I think about that question, if you put, objectives, key results first, and make sure that we're aligned on those. The culture and values part of that will have to be, will be on display by the leaders even more so, because you have to make a decision. Meaning you have to say these are aligned or they're not aligned, or we have to get aligned on objective yeah. key results and so on and so forth. But at the same time, um, at the same time, values are being lived out as you are displaying how you choose to disagree or agree. Like, Krenar, remember what I told you when I sat with your leadership team? I told Krenar, which I didn't tell him beforehand, uh, 11 of his leaders were on the table. And I opened up by saying this entire day, this in, throughout the entire day, it was a 10-hour day with his team, Bre you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner facilitation. And I said the entire day, Krenar can only ask qualifying questions. And then I gave a few examples. You know, oh, tell, can you explain that more? Right? Can you go into more detail there? Right? But he could, no comments, no declaratives. And I could tell that, <laughs> <laughs> I could tell that he was a great leader. And at the end of that day, he also pulled me aside and said, um, I wouldn't have changed a thing. But until someone puts you in a frame of mind, like watch your, watch them, watch your team do its magic, right? Because he hired all the, the best people, right? To the point where he may even shed a tear or two throughout the conversation, right? Uh, because it was so moving to see his team move, communicate, in, in a very similar fashion that he had with passion and urgency. Um, so I don't know. That's how I would think about uh, objectives. Key results usually come after you've, you've found some folks because you aligned with them according to vision, mission, values. And because you're aligned with your vision, mission, values, the objectives and key results almost fall into place. To your point, Chad, of, you know, can we have our cake and eat it too? I, yep. I think if you get the cake, vision, mission, values, right, you can then eat it through objectives and key results. Next. Um, at least that's the way I think about that. Yeah, I, I, that's a great way to summarize it. Um, yeah, I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Um, and if they are, um, I don't really know how you get to the end state, honestly. Uh, because they're, mm -hmm. they're, more, they're more pitfalls, you know, if you, if you lack those that prevent you from reaching those objectives. And so, um, but, you know, you don't, it doesn't have to be perfect. None of it has to be perfect. And yes, you know, you can have a gap in, you know, values or laps in values and overcome that. And there's, and there's learning along the whole process too. And, and then you also have to realize that people come to organization at different stages in life. Right. And so here I am an old dog learning new tricks. Right. So I'm definitely growth, you know, growth mindset all the way. Um, but you have young folks that come into an organization, um, that are, you know, grow up in different cultures and, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, different expectations. And then there's generational gaps with, with employees. I mean, like our, our company, we have a pretty big span of, of experience, life experience. And not all, all of those values will be completely aligned. Right. Um, so it's finding, it's finding those that connective tissue and, and it's really harping on it where we do connect and where we do see eye to eye. And sometimes I think that's, that's oriented around a problem set. And I would say, from my military mm -hmm. life, the most successful teams I've ever been on are ones that had hard problems to solve, you know, and right yeah. now in the military is in this lull in the action, right? And so, yeah, we call it idle hand syndrome in the military. And those are the dangerous times. When you're aligned around a problem set, 
everyone's jamming towards that that goal together. And you can really kind of overcome all of the the obstacles that would manifest um, mm-hmm. in maybe a calmer situation. And I think the startup world is, is very similar to that, where as long as we understand where we're going together collectively, um, we can overcome some of the uh, the deficiencies and values that you might align. And values is, I, I guess that's probably, that's kind of a scary term to throw around loosely because values are so important. Um, but but that's that's kind of how I see it, man. I think that you can really, um, you can really kind of navigate those well as long as you're focused on the prize. Let me share a story of mission focus, purpose, and leadership. Matt Biggie, a rare breed of VC, who has served our country in the U.S. Army's 10th Mountain Division, served as a distinguished infantry officer, both airborne and ranger qualified. He knows something about commitment and courage. Matt channels that same dedication into the world of tech, VC, and entrepreneurship. He's not just any investor. He's a true founder operator, having played both roles and served our country honorably in uniform. He brings a unique perspective to venture capital. I'm proud to call him a friend and mentor. Matt joined Crosslink Capital as a partner in 2016. Crosslink was founded in San Francisco in 1989 with $4.2 billion under management, experienced over 50 exits, 17 IPOs, and they focus on seed and Series A investments. They write checks between $1 and $9 million of initial investments, and they are North American focused. A selection of their portfolio includes Copa, BetterUp, Enigma, and Crossbow. Matt focuses his venture investments on areas like cybersecurity and digital transformation. He has experienced successes like Veridin and CloudShield, but most importantly, his reputation among founders is rock solid. Matt is behind numerous success stories in the tech landscape with an impressive portfolio of category-defining companies. Crosslink and Matt's impact on the venture scene is profound. I'm grateful to know him, work with him, and learn alongside him and the team at Crosslink Capital. Matt is a passionate baseball fan and dedicates his time to the Honor Foundation, where he assists special operation veterans in transitioning to the civilian world. To learn more about Matt and Crosslink Capital, please visit crosslinkcapital.com. Chad, what's what's a bullet or timestamp you have from the McRaven conversation that we can dive into? Well, the, so I have, you know, you told me to give you three and I got you three. Um, and I did them in, cr- in chronological order, but I won't tell you them. And I'll tell you in priority order for me personally. Um, yes. And the one that stood out to me the most uh, is relative to transition. Okay. And so that's obviously mm-hmm. near and dear to your heart. Um, you know, I was the benefactor of going through the transition foundation and still in the mindset of I'm living on the reputation I had in the military all of the mementos mm-hmm. that, that define me. Um, and my desire was to completely defy all those things and go, go out and make myself and reinvent myself with an industry and, but then still clinging on to those mementos and artifacts. And it took me, I will tell you, it took me a, a solid year to grow past them. And I've mm-hmm. got, I mean, if you see behind me, I've got the constitution back there because it's so big, I don't know where to put it. I've got a great American flag. And, you know, that's it. And so, um, and everything else is in boxes in the attic. And I had to mentally transition from, this is not my identity. I had a great run. Yeah, It's foundational experiences for me that are going to make me successful in the next life, but it is not me anymore. And there is a catharsis that happens with it. You know, there's a mourning that happens with that, that life. Because for me personally, and, and, you know, Krenar, I went to Norwich as well. I just did it later in life. But um, as I went through the military... Oh, is it your master's or...? And, and no, I got my undergrad there at night uh, while I was in the military. Oh, but, um, oh that's amazing. Wow, I didn't even know that. That yeah. is... Yeah. I didn't know that either. No, it's all I did not amazing. know that. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, my, that's great. my entire adult life was spent in the military. Wow. And so it's I, I always equate my military experience to, uh, to like Shawshank Redemption or prison. It's like you get out of the, you get out of prison. And you're like, well, what do I do with myself? You know, and you have a choice. You can stay kind of locked into that mindset and live off those experiences and and never grow, or you can say that was really cool. 
this one's going to be way better. And um, I am in that kind of that metamorphosis post military of really realizing the potential in front of me, and it's exciting. And some guys learn it faster than I did. It took me it took me about twelve months, but uh, I should have done it in twelve days. But I'm not that good. That's that's remarkable. And then what was your and and so uh, Chad did graduate the Honor Foundation. And Chad was also is also the first uh, fellow from our program that I have invested in as an entrepreneur. So for the rest of my life, Chad um, will always be known as a as a special person because of his work at the Honor Foundation of going through as a fellow and then uh, building something meaningful uh, that I that I had the opportunity to invest in and hope to keep investing in for as long as I can and for as long as they'll have me. Um, so Grenard on the topic of transitions, which, you know, for a founder, it's daily transitions. And then there's larger milestone transitions. The transition is a topic that, you know, going from building something like a transition Institute for the special operations community. And then what I immediately recognized as being a VC almost instantly, because that was the lens that I was coming to the sector with, which is a transition and paying close attention to when people are going through a transition because it's different, right? When you, there's, there's a two word question that brings, that has brought every great founder and every great operator to their knees. Uh, and it's only two words and it's what's next. That two word question has been asked in personal relationships, has been asked in professional careers that just brings people to their knees. If there's not clarity around what's next. And I don't think VCs talk enough about the transition that has to take place and founders talking enough about this as a whole person change going from one stage of investment to a next stage of investment, going from this stage of investment to the next stage of investment. And so, you know, Krenar give, you know, one of my favorite jobs quotes is you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect the dots looking backwards and you are two stages uh, and 250 headcount, I think. 100, roughly. 170 right now. Okay, uh, 170, sorry. Um, so 150 or so, 160 or so headcount ahead of where Chad is at in his journey. How would you talk to Chad about the change and transition you had to make from C to A, from A to B, from B to C, and so on? Don't take this any other way other than if you listen to Admiral Mike Craven, simple, it's simple, but it's very hard. I think that's the, if you listen to him around, sim- leadership is simple, but yes, it's hard. It's simple not to lead easy, on the yeah. front, but it's not yes. easy. I think the way, the Cronar that you see today, whereas the Cronar that started the company in 2015, putting the trackers inside the truck on my own, writing the code on my own, checking the software on my own, like, running the company completely on my own (laughs) compared to now with 170 people, it's the same. I've been thinking about that quite a bit. Am I the same human? I am the same human. It's the same Krenar because I've always been authentic and that's something that you never want to change because I don't think you can change that. Anybody can change that about themselves. However, one thing that I would say is I've always had an open mind and I know that I always had to change as a leader on how I delegate, on what matters the most, and what I need to focus on throughout the day will change. I used to write code. I'm never, I haven't touched code in years. Uh, I used to make all the sales calls. I haven't talked to, like I talk to customers a lot. <laughs> like that's, I think as a leader, you have to do that, but I don't go and close deals anymore. And that change is something that you have to go with an open mind and know that you actually want, and I, as as a, as a leader, want to actually go through that transition because I want to see myself evolve as a human being to start something that I had to lead only myself in the beginning to lead 170 in one day, hopefully thousands of people and thousands of customers as we grow as a company. But if you go with that mindset that I want to go through those changes, and I want to evolve as a human, and I know it's going to be difficult because you have to break these mental barriers that we have, um, mm-hmm. then it's going to get easier. 
Sounds simple. Right? Well said. It's not. <laughs> yeah, it's leadership made easy, but not simple. Um, so, Chad, your number two priority that you brought up, your three. What's your second one? You know, I was trying to find, I sure wrote the time steps down when I wrote these down, but the other one was losing, losing your edge. Um, hmm. I, don't, I don't know if you remember that in the, uh, you'll, you'll have to I search do. the timestamp for me. Um, but that, and that was the first thing that stood out to me. Um, I agree with everything he says on leadership. I mean, there's all the, you know, tried and true adages, and, but really it's, you know, lo- losing your edge and then also you know, finding it again and getting back in there and being, um, you know, what you need for the yeah. circum- the situation you're in. And, you know, in the military, sometimes maybe that's perceived as aggression or uh, assertiveness. Um, but, you know, when you, like I said, when you leave the military, also, are you, are you throttling up or are you throttling down? And so as I approach this, this adventure that I'm on right now, um, my edge is, is honed and actually I'm maybe sometimes out too far in front of my skis at times. Um, but I also recognize that that motivation that exists and that fire in my belly right now might not exist in 10 years. And so, um, I'm going to yeah. take advantage of it where I'm at right now in life. And, um, that edge is, uh, is not lost. It's just repurposed. And so, uh, it's exciting to kind of, um, find where I can be effective and, um, you know, there's a lot of different terms, different titles. Um, but I, I think a lot of it's just, like I said, in the beginning, it's universal. And so, um, using the skills I have using that intrinsic motivation that keeps me fired up every day, um, and not losing my edge personally. It maybe ties to my cycle mark quite well, if you don't mind, Joe, I don't Please. know if you, yeah, it's the one around boldness, which was, uh, what was the, the, the section? the boldness factor and effective leadership. It yep. just it ties maybe to the edge component that you mentioned, Chad, because he said, Admiral says something around, I'm looking for people who fail, but then don't give up and they're okay to fail again. They're unafraid to fail again. And what you notice sometimes in some leaders or entrepreneurs is that they fail once, they, I'm going to use this term on my own, I guess, but they, I think, get kept hostage by their failure. They become hostages of their failure and they don't want to fail again. And then now they're afraid to make another bad decision or a good decision or make any decision. But if you can somehow every single day wake up with the same enthusiasm and the same energy and the same edge, even Mm -hmm. after failure, even after you made a bad decision, I think that's uh, something that I strive to do, but it's again, very difficult. Uh, but, but if we can go to every decision without fear, and that, that I think makes a big difference. But that was a really good one that I really liked from Admiral. Um, so honor truly is, and integrity truly is, it's the foundation of leadership. And we don't always get it right. And, and I'm the first to admit, look, uh, I have made mistakes in my life, many mistakes in my life. But if you understand that the foundation is about being honorable, and you know what being honorable looks right looks like. It mm-hmm. looks like what your parents or your guardian or your Sunday school teacher told you it looked like. Right. That hasn't changed. You know, be men and women of good character. Don't lie, cheat, steal, or tolerate those who do. These are things that are easy to understand, and you know what to come back to. If you have no concept of honor, yeah. and you think it is honorable to to be disrespectful to people, to be dismissive of people, uh, to make money at the expense of other people, then when you falter and you fail, which you will, you won't know where to come back to. You won't have a good anchor point from which to you know, build back up again. Now, so that's why, to me, it was the most important chapter in the book. Let me share a story about one of my earliest investments, a story of innovation, leadership, and the quest to make the invisible visible. Meet Krinar Komani, CEO and founder of Tithe, a visionary who had dedicated nearly 20 years of his life to developing breakthrough ideas in data analytics, logistics, and electronics design. From working on the world's first software-defined radio at Bitwave to developing highly efficient cellular-based stations at ETA devices, Krinar has always been at the forefront of innovation. But Krinar's greatest achievement is Tithe, 
a global supply chain visibility company that is changing the way businesses handle their shipments. Using IoT sensors, Tive captures critical real-time data as products are shipped around the world, ensuring that your freight arrives on time and in full. More than 500 global shippers, logistics service providers, and retailers trust Tive to provide them with real-time location and condition tracking, actionable insights, and 24-7 live monitoring services. With a cloud-based platform that actively reduces delays, minimizes rejected loads, and decreases theft, damage, and spoilage, Tive is the solution that businesses need to succeed in today's fast-paced world. And it all started with Krenar's vision to unlock hidden potential and deliver market innovation. His leadership and passion for bringing new ideas to market have been the driving force behind Tive's successes. To learn more about how Tive can help your business, please visit Tive.com. That's T-I-V-E dot com. Yeah, I'm going to pile on Krenar and, and, and Joe. So something that it was a misnomer growing up in the military in the soft community was these terms like, you know, uh, no room for error or, you know, failure is not an option. And you're like, that. And so it creates a sense of fear around those, those terms and those experiences. And those experiences are essential to growth. You can't have growth without them. You don't, you don't get to jump the line and say, I'm an experienced guy and I've always succeeded in my life. And that's why I'm here. It's usually the guys with the cuts and scars that get to the end and go, yeah, man, I'm here and it was hard. Um, and here, let me share what I've learned with you. And so, um, you know, I think that's, so that is definitely prob- more adopted within the uh, entrepreneurial community. Like it's a, it's a recognized fact. Mm-hmm. And even in the VC world, right? Especially in the VC world, I guess. I mean, because what is it? Mm-hmm. Nine tenths of your investments maybe aren't going to hit. And so yeah. when you look at the military, the military wants to have their cake and eat it too on that term. It's like, we're going to embrace failure, but don't ever fail because you'll never get promoted, but we're going to embrace right. it. Okay. <laughs> um, and so that becomes, that becomes right. a cultural dilemma within the military that they have to overcome if they want to change it for the positive, in my opinion. I'm going to keep yeah. going on this. Cause I love, uh, it ties actually a little bit to the imposter syndrome that he talks yes. about, uh, which is very interesting because I love his answer. I mean, people around us might be much smarter than us. They might have a ton more experience than us. But we're here to learn as founders and entrepreneurs. We're here to learn to become better and understand things. I, and if you put another view to that and what he says, I mean, all of us, when we were born, none of us knew how to walk. <laughs> and we learned how to walk and we learned how to run. Um, if we go with that mindset that the people in the room, they have much more experience than I have. But they, when mm-hmm. they were born, none of them knew how to walk either. None of them knew how to run. And, and now here they are. And one day, potentially, I'm going to learn a lot from them and become who I want to become because of their experiences. But I think that mindset then completely erases the imposter syndrome because you completely take a different lens. And I love his uh, Admiral McRaven's answer there. What feedback and advice would you give to a founder that I know is going to listen to this? And say, yep, I definitely have imposter syndrome, uh, Admiral McRaven. Uh, how do I get over that when I'm surrounding myself with people who are so much more talented than I am? Yeah, well, it, it, I, I can't remember when the term of art imposter syndrome came into play, but it's been here in the last couple of years, of course. Yes. Um, we all have imposter syndrome. That's what I would tell you. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I walk into a room, uh, once again, I know I'm not the smartest person in the room when it comes to pick a topic. Yeah, I mean, I'm in, I'm in corporate America. I'm in the finance industry now. If I'm in a room with people that are doing M and A, I am by far and away not up to speed. I'm in the oil and gas business. I don't know it near as well. So you walk in and you realize that I would say it's not you're not an imposter. What you are is you're just not as experienced as a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And so I go into these in, these environments to learn. I'm going to listen. I'm going to try to be better at what I'm doing. Now, if all of a sudden you're in charge and you're the founder and you come in and and you realize that maybe you're not quite as up to speed as some of the other people in the room, that's okay. Mm -hmm. We're all on their experience. You can be honest with them. I mean, when I took over the job as the chancellor of the University of Texas, 
I mean, I sat down with my staff on day one and said, look, uh, let's be clear here. I don't understand higher education. I don't understand health care. You're going to teach me. Mm. I'm going to learn from your experience. I'm going to draw on your experience. I'm going to you know, take your opinions in. At the end of the day, I'm going to make the decision. Um, but that doesn't yeah. make you an imposter. It makes you a good leader. That's right. You know, you're going to listen. Uh, but, you know, good leaders also know how to pull all the pieces together and make something of value to, of that. One thing I this comes up often. The idea of imposter syndrome comes up often on my one on ones with founders. And they use it so kind of free flowing as if it's already a banner on them as a founder. And it's and so I had to come up with a way to break state when founders are in this mindset. And are you committing fraud, right? So that's the question that I come up with, that I respond back to them when they start talking to me about, about imposter syndrome. Of course, they're like, no, no, I'm not committing fraud. Well, the definition of an imposter uh, means that you're actually committing a fraud, right? So you're, you're not committing a fraud. You're not a fraud. Uh, what you might be feeling is overwhelmed, but that's not imposter syndrome. You're a founder. And I usually end up saying, aren't you glad you volunteered for this job? Like, I think there's a, there's like a reset that has to take place. Like you didn't need to be doing this. You volunteered for this role. And now you are, the reality takes a minute to catch up with the vision that you had in your mind. So now you've already proven to yourself that you can bring this vision into reality. So therefore you're not a fraud. You're not an imposter. You thought you could do something and you did it. So can we just stop talking about this? now and start talking about building and shipping product because that's what you're really designed to do here um, and have the confidence to do that. So I, I love that. And, and so Chad, what's your, what's your third one, your third priority? I wrote down uh, momentum and identity were the, the two words that are brought up. And, um, you know, when I think of, you know, kind of where, where, where we're at in our cycle. And you mentioned kind of the early stage of, you know, being seed, seed plus, driving towards an A, um, reaching momentum, having the knives come out with an industry, which is a marker that we're doing something right. And, you know, that momentum. And then, you know, is your identity wrapped up in that success and that momentum? Um, and I, I certainly, it certainly was when I was in the military, you know, and, um, but I think that, you know, for me personally, uh, I think the, um, you know, the company, I fully believe in it. I live it and I breathe it all day. Um, the hard problems you're solving, um, I don't think they're unique to this product. I think that there are people that are problem solvers and industry kind of agnostic. They could go in somewhere and, and make sense of it. Um, but I think orient around that identity um, and maybe potentially even being bigger than that is, you know, kind of um, what I am going through is this maturation as a um, in my second life, my second career. So, you know, I think those things, uh, the momentum and identity, I think there's some there's a symbiotic nature to them. Um, but I also don't want to get wrapped up in uh, the excitement of the momentum. Like I, I want to be very even keeled and pragmatic that, you know, this is a season. You know, and Krenar, you mentioned getting down to the point where, you know, you probably were struggling to even figure out how to make payroll with that much money in the account. And those stresses, um, you know, are are probably making the joy of the position you're in that much better, right? And so raising these successive rounds of, of, of financing um, and realizing that you're going to be okay for a couple of years now, uh, that sense of relief is something that maybe can't be embraced without understanding the trials of, of being that close to, you know, having to start over. And so, um, you know, I know I'm kind of off on tangents, but I, I there's so many really, no, many, no, really you're interesting, not. It, certainly interesting parallels, um, of dealing with stress and, you know, really high stakes situations where your, you know, Kunar, your, your position as a leader, um, is just as important as uh, a military leader making decisions, not life and death, but certainly individuals' livelihoods. And so, um, yep. you know, the stakes are the stakes are very, very high within this. And so, uh, that also can probably give people a, a rush in entrepreneurship, right? That you're kind of um, 
you know, there's it's high stakes. There's a bit of a gamble to it. Um, but there's also the pragmatism that I, I seek to have within this next life of, of approaching things very measured and, um, uh, and non-emotionally. Well, I do know that there's, there's, there's one story that, that sticks out in my mind about momentum and comfort. Um, because comfort truly does breed a very slow death. And we've heard this a thousand times that success is a horrible teacher. Uh, there's a story that I heard from, um, uh, from a bit of a legend, a bit of a legend, uh, directly, this gentleman named Mike Moritz from Sequoia Capital. And he was, he was telling a, a story once about this entrepreneur who I'll tell you at the end who it was, but this entrepreneur, um, uh, picked him up from the airport. And when he got inside of the car, he looked and and the, the radio had been torn, ripped out of the dashboard of the car. And, you know, he didn't say anything because they didn't really know each other. He was coming to due diligence on the company. And, uh, you know, he spent the day with each other and he was very impressed. And on the way back from the airport, you know, he had to ask himself, he had to ask the entrepreneur, um, hey, like what happened to your radio? Like someone rob it? And he goes, uh, no, no, I, I found myself getting too comfortable on my commute and I wasn't thinking about Microsoft. So I, so I ripped the radio out of the car because I was getting too comfortable on my rides to and from the office. And obviously the entrepreneur was Bill Gates. Um, and after he told that story with, you know, of course, authenticity, I mean, there's an obsessiveness to, for someone to do that, uh, to their own personal property. And then he literally came back to headquarters and said, we're investing in, in Microsoft. And so there's, you know, people talk a lot about the framework that goes into venture investing. And this is a big part of TLC equation that, you know, you have the quantitative lens that everybody has, right? Every venture person has their quantitative data that they have to have on the back, on the back end of market size and, you know, uh, TAM, SAM, SOM, like all these different things. And, uh, that's of course has to be there. But to me, that's a bit of the, that's a bit of the given what isn't in the given. And I, and from all the different investments that we've seen make or break VCs over time were the ones that were done entirely off of instinct. And if we can quantify instinct, that to me is the most important thing, which is what TLC equation is. How clear is the founder on vision, mission values, right? How clear are they on that end state? that they hope to achieve alongside others? How clearly can they see that, right? What are the principles like that they carry around with them? What's the character and ethos of the company? And how do they think, act, feel, and communicate into the world? Those are also quantifiables, but yet we, we think of them more as qual and not quant, when in fact they're absolutely quant. If you know what you're listening for, it can be measured. And so to me, that's the difference. It's all these stories. I had the founder of Google Ventures tell me once, and this is so true for both of you and what you're building. He said, any time a founder tells me their pitch and I take a step back and I think, if they can do that, that would be like magic. When I get that gut feeling that someone in front of me is going to accomplish something magical, I know now I have to go into diligence because it's, I want to be a part of magic. And Chad, I think what you're building and, and Krenar, what you're building holistically um, around transparency through all things that are moving around this planet. Um, that's magic if we could do that. So uh, let's, let's focus on one or two. I'd love, this is always such a topic. I, I received so many comments about this timestamp, about the, the value of time in relation to your success. And so I'd love to know how you two think and value your time and 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 Krenar, maybe you can talk. Uh, um, Chad, you go first, but then Krenar, I'd love for you to talk about how your how you valued you, valued your time has changed from when you launched the company to to where you are now. <laughs> well, Joe, you you got the you had the good fortune of hearing the back brief from me after the first what six months of the company, where I was <laughs> you know yeah. trying to boil the ocean and. I was given the <laughs> longest leash possible. I was really the only guy working at the time. And I'm like, I'm going to do this. And it shouldn't take me more than a year to win. Like, I was like, oh, we can be a billion dollar company in a year. I got this. Okay, let's go. And so <laughs> I, I went, I went and I, Wait, sorry, 
I bashed down every door in front of me. And it was like, it was like an action movie from the eighties. I had two Uzis and I was just coming in and spraying. <laughs> and so, you know, that first year I had no mentor. There was no one walking me through this saying, Chad, listen, let's be a little bit more tactical. Okay. as how we're approaching these markets. I was like, no, it, it will, it will reveal itself to me if I just keep doing what I'm doing. And, um, so as I transitioned from the hardships and heartache of the, that, you know, that is frenetic experience. Now mm-hmm. I'm more measured. Now I'm learning to say no. And I'm also learning to understand very quickly what the value is going to be. And mm-hmm. those are things that come through experience. I'm still new at it, but um, that is protecting my time, which is protecting my sanity and making my wife happy. So um, that, that balance is really important to me now. Yes. Love that. Yeah. It's it's similar, I would say, in the beginning. Uh, we wanted to I still remember this was 2016, trying to, I wanted to raise a two th- $2.5 million round out of the gate. <laughs> like just an idea. And uh, I had like complete failure. Nobody was giving me two and a half million dollars. I was a nobody. Nobody knew me. I'm not a known quantity. I just like worked for a couple of startups. Um, and then one of the, VCs who invested from Hyperplay Venture is like, hey, why don't you like back it up a little bit and start with 500k <laughs> and then see where it goes. And obviously, when we did, when I did that, I was able to move much faster. I think that uh, helped me quite a bit. Like you said, you're going out there like thinking you're gonna get to a billion dollar in revenue. You should have seen the revenue charts <laughs> when I started the company. <laughs> We're almost there, by the way, <laughs> where I was supposed to be two years in. And I think yeah. every founder has that. Um, but with time, you realize that just things actually take time. And if you, the, mm-hmm. the part that I've learned over time, which I wish I knew two, three years into the company, now it's been eight and a half years, I wish I had the wisdom earlier, is to keep things simpler back then. And you mm-hmm. said, Chad, trying to boil the ocean. In the beginning, I was trying to also boil the ocean a little bit. But if I get simple, we just do one thing simple, track a shipment from point A to point B. And that's what we do today. But if I had that mindset of simplicity early on, uh, I think could have used time much more efficiently. But it's hard. It's really hard. But now I do it. And the simpler things become, mm-hmm. the more difficult they're becoming, what I'm realizing. And then the, sec- the second thing on time, I've started to have larger blocks of empty spots on my calendar so I can actually think where this company is going to go, what we're going to do a year from now, half a year from now, this next quarter, Mm -hmm. what leaders do we need in the company in the position to scale us from 29, 30 million, we are revenue to 100, 200, 300 million in revenue. Um, Because if you're like, if I took myself a year ago, meeting after meeting after meeting every 30 minutes, the calendar is fully blocked. There's no time to think. I don't think that's the right way to lead the company. Uh, but but through, I have to change and I have to be cognizant of that. And I think that's something that I'm working on. Well, let's do some uh, some quick ending lightning round questions for you both. Awesome. Can I have one more though? Last one? Yes. Is the, oh, please. Honor, yes, the honor code. It's so simple. Yes. <laughs> And the Norwich one, I don't know if you know, Chad, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, or tolerate those who do. It's mm. the same one at Norwich University, same one as West Point, because Alden Partridge was a superintendent at West Point, and then he left West Point and started Norwich, and he took the same <laughs> honor code from West Point to Norwich University. And I've, like that has been almost every single class, sometimes professor would bring that up, um, that has been pounded in my head. But it's so simple. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, or tolerate yeah. those who do. Um, yeah, that's something. I mean, he spoke about that, and I was thinking about, it, oh my god, this is I lived with this for four years, but then it got ingrained in my brain. Hmm. I do love you that. remember that chat, or I don't know. I'm the online version. All they cared about that I paid my tuition on time. We got paid. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there we go. <laughs> but you know, I will tell you that that um, that that's a truism uh, in the industry that I'm in. So I we swim with the big defense primes that a lot of these you know chasing after the same contracts or whatever it may be. And they have an army of BD folks 
They know what they're doing, but they've never served. Mm-hmm. They don't have an emotional attachment to the mission. And so I approach this completely differently. And I'm authentic. I'm honest with people. I'll tell you where we're at technology-wise. And it served me well. And so in the past, you know, I would say three to four months, um, you know, the the momentum momentum has changed in our favor in a and all that hard work paid off, but it was also all a lot of the honesty and um mm. and people knowing that they could ask me and I would tell them the truth. And so um I'm not gonna change that. And so even moving forward, you know, that's gonna be, you know, we talk about what are your unspoken values. Um, well, obviously I just espoused it, but um that that hopefully will m- remain constant with not only myself but the people we hire on. Um, that this will not become the typical, you know, defense prime that is scooping up the market. We're going to build things that are useful for the teammates that I used to have, and so um, you know that has to remain as kind of our north stars as a company. So yeah, it resonates with me. Now getting to this last lightning round bit of a question i get this a lot you know don't take things personally in a startup you know it's business and whenever i hear people say that i don't think they've ever had a startup i don't think they've been part of a startup um there's a big sign in my gym uh in my home that says take things personally a declarative statement take things personally and then there's a big picture of michael jordan staring down uh magic johnson with the death stare of a million death stares. And there's something about people who take their work so seriously that it's anything but work. It's not what you two are doing is not a job, right? It's, it's not even considered work. It's, it's something much, it's a higher calling than that. However, when I do talk with my founders often, there are certain things that they maybe take more personally than than they should and so i pose this question to you what do you both take most personally when it's discussed Kernel, i want to hear your personal stories about vcs passing on you because that's what is the uh the thorn in my side right now <laughs> you know <laughs> oh really <laughs> uh, for me i mean i actually i I, lo- I enjoy when they pass because i learn a lot from that and the way i take that every no i take with a why and then I take that why half of the whys are real, half of the whys are not real, and there's no point of it. But those half of the whys, are there something there, the, the reason why they said no? Sometimes it's because I was too early and didn't have the right leaders, I was doing everything on my own, or sometimes it's because the product didn't evolve, or sometimes because we didn't have a bigger moat. I'm like, okay, I just need to work on that. So when I go next time, I create that line. So that's how I look at it, but what do I take personally? I guess, yeah. Maybe Chad, you can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> you're, on, you're on the block right now. I get a, I get a second. Deflected. Of thing. Deflected. <laughs> deflected. I gave you an easy one. <laughs> oh man, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's simple but not easy. Chad, you go first. Yeah. So, what do I take personally in the business? What do you take most personally when it's discussed around you? Yeah, you know, I think that. Um, and I think that I'll speak for Brett as well, is that um, in my life in the military was um, revolved around a lot of no's, you know, whether, it re- you know, technology related no's, we can't have that, it's too expensive, uh, it'll take too long, it's not a priority. And now we're in the position to um, build something that's user defined, that's really going to empower them and allow them to take the power back at the user level. And so, you know, I, I, you know, I, I think when people talk to me, they know that I'm still emotional about my former teammates. Um, I want to be a part of it, but I'm not. Um, I'm not. I'm not living vicariously through them anymore, but I'm empowering them in the, the best way I know how. And so, um, I take personally, uh, you know, when um, people marginalize that role or, or maybe mm. take it for granted uh, across the defense industry. I think there's a kind of an unspoken obligation to provide the the best tools uh, for those guys to go to war, um, because these are the life and life and death, you know, mechanics of our, our of our prosperity mm-hmm. as a nation, our freedom. And so, um, you know, we're we're providing a very small contribution to that, 
Um, but it's not small to the end user and it has to be right. And it has to, you know, empower them and make them safe and make them more lethal. Um, so, you know, that's a personal aspect of what I'm doing. Um, Mm -hmm. but I, I take personally when people, um, don't recognize the gravity of that, um, in their behaviors and their products, um, and in their approaches, if it's just about money, um, you know, you can smell that from a mile away. I think when there's a passion there and uh, there's a, a, an honesty in it, um, that's also just as clear to, to suss out. So those are things I take personally. I don't know. If- no, I think I know now. And, the, and I think it ties to to the beginning. Um, I, I It's silly to say it, but I take it personally when people say trackers don't matter. <laughs> <That's> just, <laughs> <laughs> so we make, we make these things. <laughs> I'm going to show it because that's how personally I take we press the button, put it on a shipment, and you get to track shipments all over the world, whether it's strawberries, blueberries, it's like servers, whether it's vacuum cleaners, anything out there we track, which is pretty amazing. But there's this concept that, pretend, and it's okay if I get proven wrong. I'm like, it's fine. I'll continue to grow no matter what. It's more that people say, well, hardware is going to get completely got commoditized, and it won't matter. Mm. And if you look at the phones, if you look at iPhone and Apple, it did not get commoditized. Yes, there are smartphones out there, but we still go to Apple because they've created this ecosystem between software, hardware, services. And that's what we're doing in supply chain logistics. And we're going to make always the most quality and most cost effective trackers in the market so the world can enjoy and, and, and create supply chains that are more efficient. But I take it personally when these like will become like nuisance or commoditized that anybody can make them any kind of shape or it doesn't matter how they look. Actually, it matters. And there's a reason why it matters. There's a reason why we, we've become one of the leaders in the market and growing and sold more than a million now as of last month, um, which is an amazing achievement. But I, ta- I take it personally. <laughs> it's silly, but I do. The other thing I would say I take maybe it's it's I grew up in Kosovo. We have 60 plus employees there. And um, hmm. I, yes, that, that like talent there is amazing. They didn't go to U.S. Grad, like graduate school or universities, but the amount of talent and what kind of output we get from the people in, in, in that country is unbelievable. And I take that quite personally, too. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to end. Um, is there anything else that we didn't cover that you guys would like to cover before we close out? I got a, a, a funny McRaven story for you. I love it. I love that. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> I love that. So in, uh, was it 2005? I had hair back then and a long beard. I was in <laughs> Afghanistan. I was in, um, with the strike force out of Kabul, a certain night Kabul out of Bagram. And, you know, I'm with a bunch of seals and I'm the air force guy. And, uh, it was Admiral McCrane was a one star at the time. So he was running one of the ACG positions. And um, I didn't know who he was. I just knew he was one of the Navy, you know, geos. And I'm in the chow hall with my, you know, small team of Navy guys. And, uh, you know, we're all dressed the same. And um, he wants to sit down with his old teammates. <laughs> and so, but no one wants to sit with the one star. You know what I mean? Like maybe the movie right. or people outside in the civilian world think, oh, you get to sit with the general. Nobody wants to sit with the general because it's awkward <laughs> and you're probably going to say something wrong. You're going to get yourself in trouble. <laughs> you're definitely going to do something wrong, right? And so um, he's walking towards our table and all the seals I'm with basically push me to the open spot. So he has us next to me. <laughs> and so he sits down and he has no clue who I am, you know? So I'm like, hey, how's it going, sir? And uh, he wants to make small talk with me because you're like obligated to talk to the guys, you know. And I'm like, hey, can I just time out real quick? I go, I'm, I'm the Air Force guy. If you want to talk to the SEALs, they're right there. And so I moved my stuff to the table for him. And he just looked at me like perplexed. And, uh, you know, of course, he's the nicest guy ever. So he keeps <laughs> talking to me. And I get a chuckle out of it. But all the uh, Navy guys are just like, you know, their hand on their head like this. But, uh, but yeah. He and he ended up being the obviously the CG later on, but um, yeah, he's a probably probably one of the, one of the better CGs we had at the command. Um, but humble beginnings, I guess. Well, I get one star. I get certainly. I mean, I could certainly talk to you guys for hours. There's so many topics that I had written out that I didn't get a chance to cover. 
Um, but you certainly have been remarkable examples of both uh, founders and humans and what you're building and what you care about, what you stand for. Uh, so I feel very grateful to be uh, a, a sliver, a small part sliver of of what you all are, are building. And I hope to um, continue to be part of your journey as long as I can. So I really respect and appreciate both of you. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate you thinking of me, man. Thank you, of Joe. Of course. Really enjoy it. All right, gents. Thank you for joining us on TLC Equation, The After Show. A heartfelt thank you to Chad and Krenar for diving deep into TLC Equation. Remember, this equation is your quiet guide and blueprint for building extraordinary teams, leadership, and culture. Continue exploring these ideas along your journey, and please follow us on YouTube or wherever podcasts are found. Until next time, stay extraordinary.